is there a heaven is there a hell and go back <laughs> you know what I'm saying go back to where you came from don't ask such blasphemous questions what Islam did for me was made me understand the purpose of life itself he's, you know smoking he's drinking he's you know womanizing and my daughter is you know going to these promiscuous parties and you know saying promiscuity is taking over my household you know when these tough problems are there then they like to call out to Allah but when Allah brings them out of the problem or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rescues them to the shore they go back to their old ways. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, assalamu alaikum, greetings and peace. Welcome to the Dean Show. We got an exciting show with Imam Sultan. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. How are you doing? Alhamdulillah, how are you, brother? Eddie? Alhamdulillah, how are things in here? Where are we at? In Florida, huh? Yes, South Florida. S south Florida. The, the mm -hmm. more south you go, the hotter it gets, huh? Mm -hmm. You adjust it with the heat? Love it. <laughs> Love it. You're not talking about going back to, to the, from Canada, huh? Yes. Yes. I do not want to go back. Let's talk about yourself now. You're an imam here in mm -hmm. Florida. Yes. How did you get to that point? You're very, you're very, uh, very young. Mm -hmm. How did you decide, at what point in your life did you decide that you wanted to be an imam? All right. So it all started when I was younger. Um, when I was about like five, six years old and I had a few surahs memorized, I would always wonder is there a heaven? Is there a hell? I mean, I'm really, I would sometimes I would think about hellfire and I'm like, hey, if I did something wrong, if I told a lie or something, I mean, am I really going to burn for this? And then these thoughts really made me somewhat disengaged intellectually from my faith. And I really only rediscovered when I was a little bit older, when I was nine, when I was, uh, you know, sent to an Islamic school by choice wasn't forced and I started memorizing the Quran um, I started reading first and then I started memorizing at the age of 10 and by 11 I'd committed it to a memory but I wanted to know what it meant you know I could have gone down the route of hey I'm a Hafiz now go down back to your secular education but I was like hey I have 114 chapters of Arabic committed to memory of which I have no clue what any of them mean. And that curiosity led me to joining the alim program that was part of the school. It was a choice that you could do the alim education along with your secular studies. So I joined it at a very young age. Usually the people who join that course are post high school, you know, graduates of high school. Um, but I joined it when I was in, in, the, in the sixth grade. After I joined, my intention was just learn the Arabic, do the first three or four years, do the Arabic, and you know go about your life, uh, you know moving on with something secular in nature. But after having done five years of that course, I was like, hey, I'm so deeply involved in religious education, and I'm young. I want to travel overseas. It's an eight-year course. I want to travel overseas to actually complete it in, in a traditional seminary. So then I went to South Africa, finished off the island program, the eight-year island program. Uh, and by the time I was finished, I was like 18. And uh, the thought occurred to me that if I stop studying and start a job, I may never get to study again. So then I enrolled in the IFTA studies, the Mufti course. And I completed that, and by 19, I was graduated, um, you know, as someone who completed the Alim program and the Mufti program. And now I was looking for a job, and I was like, there's nothing more appropriate than being an Imam with this, you know, skill set or this educational program having committed in my, uh, in my arsenal, religious arsenal, if you, if you will. So once that was completed, I mean, I, I had nothing else to do, so I'm like, you know what, let me start serving the community. A lot of my doubts and questions and, uh, you, know, you know, thoughts that I had pertaining to the validity of religion and the existence of heaven and the existence of hell, all of these were answered because I gave religion the adequate uh, chance to explain itself to me by going to individuals who really were open-minded and, you know, not so very intimidating, right? You know, your standard is you go to an imam and you ask them, hey, uh, I don't really believe heaven exists, right? Or hell exists. Or that, you know, is there even a God? 
the standard answer you'd get from an imam for, you know, for a, a person that young in age is, man, go back. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Go back to where you came from. Don't ask such blasphemous questions. But alhamdulillah, the people around me weren't so, uh, you know, rigid. They were a lot more open. They were a lot more welcoming. And they really explained it to me in a way that made sense to me. I was around people who were, you know, just a little bit older than I was, who were giving the Jumu'ah khutbahs. And on another day, they were playing basketball. And I was like, hey, the religious people can be cool, <laughs> right? And that's really what kind of drew me in and led me down the path that I went. And I felt like after graduation, the only thing right is to also inspire other young people like myself who also might have questions about their faith who need real answers mm -hmm. you know to continue down this path would really give me the opportunity to share that with people of my age I want to highlight for the not yet Muslim audience guests who might be tuning in when you said that you memorize the entire Quran all 114 chapters I want really people to think about it because this is one of the miracles of the Quran. Mm. Can you elaborate on that real quickly? Because people, you know, they, there's, if you compare it to many other different uh, religions, there's, or any just complex books that are out there, you, you don't have people memorizing their religious texts and preserving it. Over time, these texts have been changed, they've been corrupted. But now when we talk about you memorize, you're, you're, you're a walking, living example of a living miracle of the Quran. Can you just highlight what, what, does that, what does that mean? It's, again, the biggest miracle of our religion is the Quran. And its preservation is not limited to, uh, you know, physical, tangible scriptures that we have or books or manuscripts. Allah says in the Quran, inna nahnu nazzilna dhikra wa inna lahu lahafidun. We have sent down this reminder and we shall preserve it. Right, that special clause of preservation was not really uh, assured or guaranteed for the scriptures of the past. Henceforth, their alteration, adulteration, changes. Whereas for the Quran, because it was revealed to our Prophet Muhammad وسلم, the final prophet, Allah says, I will take care of the responsibility of preserving it. So if you were to take every single manuscript of the Quran and burn it, we'd still have it because millions of people commit it to memory, right? And I really felt, you know, subhanAllah, very honored and special that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed me with the opportunity. It was, when I started, I could barely memorize two lines, right? Because memorizing something word for word without getting a single decimental inflection or diacritical mark, uh, accent, uh, wrong, is not something that people aspire to do. When you memorize something, you memorize the gist of it. You memorize the essence of it, thereafter you quote it with your own verbiage. Whereas with the Qur'an, you're not allowed to do that. You have to read every, like if I were to incorrectly state or recite something in the prayer that we just prayed in Salatul Maghrib, almost every single person behind me, at least for the first chapter, would correct it. Right? Because it's so uh, intricate or so precise. And that precision is really something that, subhanAllah, it's tough to do. And when you start off, I couldn't memorize two lines, going back to that. Um, but over time, I, I really committed myself and I really said, I really want to do this. And by the end of it, a person who could not memorize two lines was capable of memorizing an entire 27 pages in one day. That was my last lesson that I memorized. I memorized 27 pages in one day. And that's, to me, that's not me. I don't think I'm capable of doing that. I'm not that special. I really understand that this is Allah and this is His miracle. And this is when He decides that somebody is a treasure chest for His book, He facilitates and He makes easy according to His will. Tell me now, for people looking at you as an Imam and they might they associate with their clergy someone who's devoted to God, now He's someone who doesn't get married, right? and lives a life of abstinence. Is that the same with the uh, Imam as a Muslim? No. Um, the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, states very profoundly, an nikahu min sunnati. Marriage is from my sunnah, from my tradition, from my ways. And Allah states Himself 
in the Quran, وَلَقَدْ أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ قَبْلِكَ رُسُلًا وَجَعَلْنَا لَهُمْ أَزْوَاجٍ وَذُرِّيَّةٍ Verily, O Messenger of Allah, before you we have sent many messengers and many prophets. We believe in all of them, Jesus, Moses, Abraham, everybody. And we've made for all of them spouses and progeny. So, it's, as a Muslim, we believe that marriage is, is something that completes you as a person. It is half of your religion and abstinence. Again, it is something that is permissible, but not something that is recommended. You don't get sin from abstaining from marriage but you do get plenty of reward for engaging in it. What if someone says, look, uh, as a Christian, we know that Jesus, they say that he didn't get married. So you say all the prophets got married, what about Jesus? Because Jesus, we as Muslims believe, has not completed his life yet. We believe he will come back and he will get married, right? And that statement of the Qur'an, there's no inconsistency in the Qur'an. Allah says, we have ordained for all of the prophets and messengers, wives and children. So the wife that has been ordained for the Prophet Jesus has not yet been tied with him in marriage, but that doesn't mean it's not going to happen because we don't believe he passed away. We believe Allah raised him and Allah will send him back uh, you know, to restore you know, uh, order and justice in the world when it becomes as, you know, subhanAllah, as corrupted as it could ever have been. Did Islam answer all the questions that you had on your mind? You mentioned hellfire, paradise, purpose of life, why you're here, you know, all of these things, did it give you the solace that you needed? Uh, did, it in, did it convince you intelli uh, intellectually that it was indeed the truth based on proof and evidence? Absolutely. Now, what I mean by that is every question that I had as a young child was answered adequately. But as you grow older, regardless of um, what era, what environment, what culture you live in, more questions develop, right? The questions that develop, at times, they may have answers that 100% satisfy you and clear you of any doubt whatsoever. But at times, you know, there are some questions that you don't understand, regardless of what answer is granted to you. But what Islam did for me is, Make, made me understand how limited humans are and how limitless God is, how limitless Allah Azza wa Jal is. And if Allah Azza wa Jal explained everything in vivid detail, then there wouldn't be a point of calling this life a test. So what Islam did for me was made me understand the purpose of life itself. The purpose of life itself, Allah says, الَّذِي خَلَقَ الْمَوْتَ وَالْحَيَاةَ لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا The purpose of life is to test you which, which one of you is best in deeds. And if everything was clearly explained, then there wouldn't be a point of calling it a test. So, I understood it like this. Early on, my father tells me, don't eat too much candy. Right? As a young child, I mean, I still am kind of a fat boy. I love candy. If I think that my dad is preventing me from candy because he's a bad guy, uh, really, like, would that make sense? No. But as a child, I don't understand that. And my father, sometimes he will explain certain things to me. He will say, you'll get a cavity, you know. But I'll say, I want it anyways. My father will say, well, it's not good for you. Cavities are not good for you. They don't, and, and he'll try explaining to a certain extent. Maybe add on diabetes, yeah, uh, potential diabetes you know, uh, and heart disease, heart potential disease, disease uh, all of these things, cancer, right? Cancer, if, yeah, if you want to go deeper, yeah. If you go deeper, right? But would the dad go as deep as he, he understands? No, he'll just give me a simple explanation. And if I accept it, good for me. If I don't accept it, well, I know better because I'm your father, right? And... One thing he may add on is, when you get older and you have your own child, you understand, right? And perhaps I will understand. And now, alhamdulillah, Allah has blessed me with a son. I do understand of caring for someone who doesn't know how to care for them. The baby really wants to go there, but he's going to hit his head. I pull him back, he starts crying. You know what I'm saying? Thinking that daddy's a tyrant. Mm -hmm. Right, but really, the daddy's not the tyrant. He's pulling you back from something that you're incapable of understanding is going to harm you. 
right? So I understood it like that. That eventually when I grow up, I'll understand the wisdom of my dad for preventing me, for preventing me from eating that candy. But if that understanding gap, if that comprehension gap is so vivid and so distant when the common denominator is limitation of mortality, that the father and the child, both mortals, just the only gap is he's a little bit older. But still this child will never understand what he knows. Now imagine comparing some human, some mortal who thinks they have it all figured out with their limitations to the unlimited Allah. Will we ever understand, fully understand the wisdom of Allah, the knowledge of Allah? It's unlimited. It's comparing something finite to something infinite. It's not even apples and oranges. It's comparing mm -hmm. like fruit to a wall, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. So really when I understood that and I, I, I said that this is really what Allah wants to test me to see if I'm only going to submit to His will when I fully understand something or am I going to submit what I understand and when I don't understand, mm. right? And the story of Ibrahim salam is something that always motivated me whenever I found myself in this conundrum. The story right? of Abraham. Of Ibrahim, of Abraham salam, peace be upon him, where Ibrahim salam, I mean, it took him a while to figure out God. It's not like he just woke up one day and believed in God. He actually uh, expended intellect, right? To come up with the idea that God is something that we, don't, we can't fully comprehend. Allah states in the Quran, فَلَمَّا جَنَّ عَلَيْهِ اللَّيْلُ رَأَى كَوْكَبًا When the night dawned upon Abraham, عليه الصلاة والسلام, then he saw a star and he said, هَذَا رَبِّي, this is my Lord. فَلَمَّا أَفَلْ, when the star faded, when the star went away, and it was daytime, he said, لَا أُحِبُّ الْآفِلِينَ I don't like things that fade away. And then the next night he looked at the moon, he's like, wow, this is beautiful. هَذَا رَبِّي, this is my Lord. فَلَمَّا أَفَلْ, when the moon went away, <laughs> oh Allah, please show me. Show me what is the right God. And then the next day, he's, he's, he's staring at the sun. He said, Hada Akbar. This is bigger than the star and the moon. This must be my God. When the sun set, he said, Inni bari umima tushrikun. I free myself from any partner that they associate with the one God, Allah. Wa inni wajahtu wajhiya lilladhi fatra samawati wal ard hanifan wa ma'ana min al mushrikeen. And I face my face. I turn my direction to that Lord who incepted all of this who created all of this and I don't like again I completely disassociate myself with anything or any concept that makes it seem like God is fully comprehensible right and that story really motivated me to stay on the right track of okay you if you understand this Sultan accept it if you don't understand this Sultan accept it even harder mm -hmm. because that's what Muslim means, someone who submits. This is the way of life of all the prophets and messengers. And now you're living it and you're getting all this experience being an imam. Tell us in the last few minutes that we have, what are some of the major challenges that you're seeing being a leader in the community with the youth, with even the uh, adults? The challenge is, uh, I'd like, I wouldn't do it justice in, in a sentence, so I'd rather choose a prophetic statement. Mm -hmm. to give it some, some flesh, and then I'll add, you know, theory to it. The Prophet says, In the dunya hulwatun khadira, that this world is lush and green. Mm. فيها, and Allah will place you in it as representatives, as vicegerents, to see what you will do. He says, dunya. So refrain to the best of your ability from this world. So this hadith really captures the struggle that majority of us, not just here in South Florida, but the majority of us Imams face in the, face in the West. The people come here from all walks of life, from all different you know, ethnicities, from all different countries in pursuit of a better life. And in their mind, a better life translates to more material. And more material means more happiness in their mind. Before they figure out that that's the wrong idea of a better life, usually it's, I wouldn't say it's beyond repair, but it's, it's at a very difficult point 
uh, that re repairing it is it becomes the challenge that contemporarily imams in this society face. So whether it's you know, you know, staying away from religion, keeping it at a minimal, in order to appease the folks around us, you know, and you know, make it seem like, hey, I will assimilate to this culture, this Western culture, better if I'm more materialistic. If I involve myself in the things of this world a lot more and keep religion to a Jummah, keep religion to a Ramadan, Tarawi, you know, a few rakats and you know what, you know, you're a good Muslim, you know, pray every now and then whenever you need God, you know, holla at him and yeah. you know what I'm saying, he'll, and then he'll respond. Basically Allah, like a genie in a bottle. Yes, yes. Allah says, Allah even complains about that in the Quran. Uh, you know, uh, what's, what's wrong with people? Why, why do they only call out to me when they need me? I mean, harf. And some people who worship Allah on edge, if good things come, be like, oh, God's good. If they ever find themselves in a challenge and tribulation, <laughs> they turn away from Him. Or they say, right, When they are in a turbulent circumstance. Allah is using the example of, of you know, waves in an ocean that are about to you know, swallow you up. Allah says when you're in these turbulent, it represents all of life, when you're in these turbulent waves and they call out to Allah and say, Oh Allah, I'm in a problem. Oh Allah, you know, my son is you know, off of you know, the right path. He's you know, smoking, he's drinking, he's you know, womanizing. And my daughter is you know, going to these promiscuous parties and you know, saying promiscuity is taking over my household. You know, when these tough problems are there, then they like to call out to Allah. But when Allah brings them out of the problem or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rescues them to the shore, they go back to their old ways. So really, religion has just become, like you said, a genie in a bottle. You know, if we need it, if we need something from God, oh Allah, something is wrong in my life. My business is not going good. Oh Allah, I'm going to come to your house. I'm going to pray. Allah fixes up the business, going back to never remembering Allah and having Him as something in the background, as a screensaver in your mind, mm -hmm. right? And subhanAllah, that is the challenge that really if you want to sum it up without going into all the derivatives and the details of the problems the different precise problems that people struggle it's really lack of uh, wanting to affiliate with religion thinking of it as extreme thinking of it is uh, as as anti-secular you know thinking of it as anti-progressive you know what I'm saying hence all these other you know issues that mm -hmm. contemporarily we face that generations before us, right before us, have not faced. It's really just thinking that religion is a barricade, is a blockage against being progressive. Whereas we know, both you and I, Brother Eddie, know that Islam has been progressive. Islam has always been something that, you know, taught humans to be better even in this life. Right? Taught humans to be more accomplished even in this life. The Prophet Wasallam never prohibited us from advancing in this life. Yeah. But Muslims today forget at what cost. So it's not the progressive in the terms of now I'm progressive so I don't have to uh, pray. I don't have uh, to pray. I don't have to go to gym. I don't have to wear hijab. I don't have to do this, yes. that, and the other. And I start modifying the deem and you become mm. like a, what, a modified Muslim? No such thing, but you know. <laughs> yeah, progressive Muslim, they like to call it. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Progressive Muslim. A progressive Muslim does not, you know, again, this is generalizing. Yeah. Right? yeah there's exceptions to every rule. But a progressive Muslim in common portrayal, uh, is somebody who has nothing of the external imagery of Islam. You know, it's really a, a, a misuse of the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ where he says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَنظُرُ إِلَىٰ أَجْسَامِكُمْ وَلَا إِلَىٰ صُوَرِكُمْ وَلَا يَنظُرُ إِلَىٰ قُلُوبِكُمْ وَلَكِنْ يَنظُرُ إِلَىٰ قُلُوبِكُمْ وَعَمَالِكُمْ That Allah doesn't look at your apparent, He doesn't look at your face, He doesn't look at your bodies, He looks at your hearts, right? It's a very beautiful mm -hmm. hadith but misquoted, misunderstood, misrepresented Allah by... Allah knows my heart. You know what I'm saying? Allah knows my heart, so I don't have to have anything on the external. Yeah. But my question to them would be, hey, um, then why did Allah reveal those commandments? Yeah. If He deemed them so, you know, baseless or so unimportant, then why did He legislate them? Mm -hmm. Right? So, again, uh, that is the struggle <laughs> summed up. Mm. So, uh, you are... Uh a living testimony that now at a young age, some takeaways here is that someone at that young age like yourself, you 
got to know your deen, Islam, you start to live in it, answered all the questions to why you're here, what's the purpose of life, based on proof and evidence, your testimony to that, took it to another level, now you're serving the community, you got to know your deen, was there ever any, I've interviewed a lot of different people from all walks of life, and they come from different backgrounds, some from a Christian background, this background, that background, and the more they went academically into the religion, the more they started to see the contradictions and they went away from it. But the more you went towards Islam, did it increase your Iman? Did Absolutely. It, and do you believe now this is the solution where the more people will go and embrace Islam, that this will be the solutions for all their problems? Their lives will, they, because obviously we can't escape the, the drama we're in, life is a test. But does the Islam give you the tools to manage and to get through these tests of life? Absolutely, absolutely. Because, again, someone who, if, if I had gone down the rabbit hole of, okay, well, if I can't see God, I, I won't believe in Him, I'll refuse to believe in Him, then what a sad life that would be. That all the death that I encountered of my friends, family, I will never see them again because they're just material they're just particles they're just chemicals they're just rocks you know same argument that the the, the prophet solicit and faced that when we die we're just going to become dust and and bones you really think we're going to be raised if i don't i didn't believe that we were going to be raised and there's going to be justice then really uh, again like wh what hope is there in living yeah. It's such a depressing life. Like all the, the 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 trauma, the struggles, all of it means nothing. If someone gets you know bombed or killed in their house in a war torn country or in an oppressive regime or something, then they're just dead. You know what I'm saying? They just become buffet for the worms of the ground, right? So really, I feel that Islam is a very conclusive and consistent answer, or uh, or a better term would be um, a layer of solace to the intellectually curious uh, about the reality of life. Thank you so much, Imam Sultan, for spending some time Anytime, with us. Anytime, brother Getty. Sharing, sharing hey, for coming to us. our masjid. Uh, please come back, man. South Florida will really be appreciative of you. Thank you. Jazakallah. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And if you like this episode of The Dean Show, like this video, share this video far and wide, and support us on our Patreon page so we can continue this work. Thank you for tuning in. Peace be with you. Assalamu alaikum.